it's too much to talk about in uh, one hour, but we try to touch upon a few items with our guests. Um, like I said, a lot of guests, and I briefly introduce them to you. Uh, one uh, of the guests is Mark Faustel. He will give an introduction of about 10 minutes. Mark is the founder and editor of iConscious, a very important photography blog, but is also working as a curator with uh, Japanese photography uh, primarily. Um, James Reed, picture editor of Wallpaper magazine. Simon Baker, curator of photography at the Tate Modern. Christine Collier, um, uh, from Galerie Fille du Gavert in Paris, also curator, but not a critic, she told me. Well, we can talk about that later on, Christine. François Ebel, director of Rencontre de Isle, the very uh, important photography festival in uh, the south of France. Uh, we will talk with them later on. Uh, first, Mark, I, will, uh, I want to invite you to come and take the stage for uh, a 10-minute introduction on the future of photography. Thank you. Hello, hello. Okay. Um, well, thanks very much, Marcel and Foam and Unseen, for inviting me to discuss this modest little question. What is the future of photography? Um, it's a question that's been asked virtually since photography has been it was invented. But it does seem that... Um, it has been coming up more frequently and more insistently of late. Um, Fred Richen, who was just here a few minutes ago, um, he alluded to the, f the uncertain future of photography with his book um, After Photography in 2008. And in 2010, the San Francisco MoMA wondered whether photography might be over uh, with a symposium and a series of, of conversations and discussions like this one. Um, in 2011, uh, the most talked about exhibition at the Rencontre d'Arles was entitled From Here On, a kind of photographic manifesto for the future. And Marcel's already talked about um, Foam's what's next question um, that's evolved into lots of different things, publications and events and exhibitions and a website. So what makes this question so relevant? It's always tempting to think that we live at a time when everything is changing and nothing will ever be the same, a pivotal time. But looking at photography today, it seems that we might be onto something. Peering into the crystal ball for photography is different than for other art forms. Wikipedia defines photography as an art, science, and practice, which could take up a discussion of its own, but... Because photography is not only an art, but also a technology, its future is not just a question of new ideas, but also of technological innovation. It's one of the most widely used technologies, and one which plays an important part in every aspect of our society. So politics, the media, um, commerce, identity, family, sex, you name it. So whatever its future is going to be, it's definitely going to be complex. But before exploring what photography's future might look like, I want to consider the idea of the future. For much of the 20th century, the future was associated with a kind of sci-fi fantasy world in which cars would fly, people would wear shiny spacesuits, and spend most of their time talking to robots. Today, we're already surrounded by all of the technologies that we used to only be able to dream of. And this kind of fantastical vision of the future seems really outdated. The pace of technological change and digital innovation has narrowed the gap, really, between the future and the present. So what I'm really trying to say is that the future is now. So what does the now of photography look like? Marcel already alluded to this, but thanks to digital innovation, we now carry a camera with us wherever we go. Camera phones like the iPhone are by far the most commonly used camera um, on Flickr, for example. And Instagram, which is designed specifically for camera phones, has somewhere north of 80 million users. And photography hasn't only become more accessible than before, but technology is also continuing to make more and more powerful cameras. So 
We can imagine megapixels are going to turn into gigapixels. Cameras are going to see in 3D. They're going to see through walls. They'll see around corners. They'll be able to see through skin and even see the invisible. And actually, cameras can already do all of these things. And in some ways, this innovation is actually making photography obsolete. One example of this is IKEA. Um, IKEA's furniture catalog is one of the most widely published uh, documents in the world. It's over 200 million copies annually, which is more than twice the Bible. Um, and the company has recently announced that it's going to replace photographs with CGI in its publications. So this year, 12% of the images were computer generated. And next year, that's going to 25%. And the idea is maybe to eradicate photography completely from their, from their um, publications. Still, even as photography is disappearing from certain areas, it's appearing in others. So cameras are not only in our phones, but they're also on the top of Google Street View cars. They're in satellites, they're on military drones, and of course, they're all over our city streets. Although much of the debate on photography's future has pitted digital against analog photography, I don't really buy the argument that digital is killing analog. On the contrary, I think it may even be reinvigorating it. Despite the desperate state of the global economy, and particularly of publishing, um, there's been a real genuine photo book boom in recent years. And although the book cannot compete with the internet in terms of disseminating and distributing images, it remains one of the most important tools for a photographer because it's one of the only ways for a photographer to be able to ensure that their work survives. Exhibitions are inherently temporary and images disappear from the internet as soon as they appear on it. So just as the vinyl market has thrived with the digitization of music, maybe the photo book market could thrive as a reaction to the disposability of the online image and the fact that it's not just the image that matters, but the form that it takes. I mean, in reality, I think the lines between the digital and analog world are, are increasingly blurred. Um, digital technology, for a long time, had, had been used to kind of emulate an analog film or to create the most perfect image possible, the closest thing to reality. But now what we're seeing is that a lot of artists, instead of rejecting the, the digital noise and imperfection of that form, are actually making use of it, um, using lo-fi digital images in an analog context. So for example, Michael Wolf or Doug Rickard have used images from Google Street View and blown them up to large prints, um, making use of that uh, art, and making an aesthetic really out of the pixels and the glitches of this lo-fi digital imagery. Um, however, I think that the innovation in the photographic means of production is maybe the least interesting phenomenon going on with digital technology. Its real impact is not how we make photographs, but in how we circulate, organize, and ultimately consume them. And for an overwhelming majority of images, this is something that takes place online. So there are 140 billion photographs on Facebook. 6 billion on Flickr, 4 billion on Instagram, and there's thousands of photographs being taken every second. And for several years now, we've recognized the fact that we live in the age of the infinite sea of images. And there have already been a number of interesting responses that have been developing as a result. Artists are increasingly using pre-existing images taken from archives, collected at flea markets or from photo albums, or simply just downloaded from the internet instead of making their own images. Um, many have attempted to give this kind of infinite sea of images a tangible form. So for example, one of the better known projects, um, Penelope Umbrico's Sons from Flickr, uh, is a grid of pictures of the sun which she extracted from, from Flickr by searching for the term sunset. And really to highlight this infinite quality of the internet, each time she exhibits the piece, she gives it a new title by searching for the term and updating the latest number of hits on Flickr. And I searched it yesterday, and it's well over 11 million. 
And uh, another example of this was Eric Kessel's contribution to the What's Next exhibitions at Foam, where he filled an exhibition space with the number of images printed in a single day, uh, uh, sorry, uploaded in a single day uh, to Flickr. He printed them out, and that number was a million. So these changes taking place in photography raise a series of questions. How are we going to teach photography in the future? Is the dark room going to go out of the window? Will we still pay mu as much attention to the print, to the photographer's object? On a more basic level, it seems strange that in a world where communication and interaction is increasingly mediated through images, they remain almost entirely absent from secondary education. We're taught to, to read and to write, and then maybe afterwards to analyze text. But when were we going to be taught to do the same thing with photographs? Looking to the future, I think I'm not going out on too much of a limb by saying that the infinite is going to get even more infinite. Um, but now that we've recognized just how many images there are, the question comes up of what that infinity looks like and how we can actually manipulate it and interact with it. Although it's now possible to store an unlimited number of images online, there's actually very few ways to organize them, to filter, to search, to explore that infinite number of images. And even if we do become able to do all of these things, how do you choose what you keep from the infinite? I think the question of the archive is a central one for the future of photography at many different levels. And one example of this, in March of 2011, when the tsunami hit the Tohoku region in Japan, um, within a matter of days, groups of people up and down the coast came together um, began to retrieve people's photographs, cleaned them, dried them, and tried to get them back to their owners in the context of total destruction, where people had lost everything. Um, that was one of the first things that people did. And I thought this was an incredible illustration of the power and the importance of photography in people's lives. But it also made me wonder, if the same thing were to happen in 20 years' time, would there be any prints to retrieve? Um, now that we all accumulate thousands of digital images from our daily lives, is there still going to be such a thing as a photo album that's a, a kind of summary of our life's experiences? And the archive is obviously also of central importance to photography institutions that collect and exhibit photographs. Will these institutions continue to focus on prints and books, or they also have a role to play in digital preservation? And if so, where do they start? Although it's generally accepted that a vast majority of uh, this infinite sea of images is probably not worth keeping, the way that images circulate online makes it much more difficult for a museum curator to explore them than a technologically savvy teenager. So just as for their collections, museums must also consider how to integrate digital elements into their exhibitions and exactly what form that's going to take. Um, there are many other topics that merit discussion, and I'm sure they're going to come up in the course of this, this panel discussion. But um, I'd just like to end by, by adding to the question, just by asking, what is the future of photography's meaning? Um, its definition, writing with light, was pretty much abandoned many, many decades ago. And for, for most of its life, photography has been associated with the idea of truth, with some kind of scientific or objective documentation of reality. But over the last few decades, this relationship has become shakier and shakier and shown to be more of an illusion. And I think we now have to ask ourselves what is going to take its place. Thank you. Or handing over some questions mm. that I can ask to the panel. And I would love to invite the panel to come to the table and take a seat and see. So this gives me a little bit more flexibility. I already gave the names. Here are the faces. I repeat the names so you know who's who. <laughs> James Reed, Wallpaper Magazine, Simon Baker, Tate Modern, Francois Abel, Rencontre d'Arles, 
Christine Aurier Field de Caver, Marc Vastel, has already introduced himself in a very convincing way, I have to say. Thank you, Marc, again. This is a higher one. <clears throat> there, are, there are a few things that immediately uh, stuck in my brain, and those were the words archive and filter. And I think those two are related in a way, because first you filter something out of the infinite to consciously store in your archive, because, mm -hmm. because an archive is something with a purpose and something that is constructed over time in a very conscious way. Um, you are also editor of a blog. Do you consider yourself to be the filter of, of now? I don't dare to say the word future. Well, I might have to, to use that as a strap line for the blog, the, future, the filter of now. Um, I mean, I think, I think that that's one, I think it's one of the most important roles um, that there can be on the internet at the moment is this idea of filtering. And uh, I'd say it's also something which really almost doesn't exist very much online. Um, I think that there's, there has been, with the explosion of social networks in particular, with Facebook, with Instagram, with um, Pinterest, with Tumblr, what you're getting is actually an acceleration of the pace of images. There's more and more that are coming all the time. And very, very little um, filtering and very, very little kind of slowing down of that pace and um, very little comment as well, very little kind of critical attention that's paid to, to, to these images that are, that are pinging around online. Um, and I, I think and I certainly hope that that is something that's going to become more important in the online space, um, in the you know in the in the immediate future, because I think uh, it's it it is totally overwhelming the amount of images and and they immediately they're constantly being recontextualized. They're as soon as they get onto the internet, they probably lose their their author's name. They might lose a title. They might suddenly end up next to images that are totally different to their context. And this happens regularly. It's a kind of constant state of flux. So I think some, some ways of, of, uh, of slowing that process down and of being able to analyze that process as well are really important online. Uh, why hasn't this happened yet? Because you say it's quite probably going to be more important in, in the very near future. Uh, you're doing it. Why are you still surprised by the well, limited number of people who are acting a, as a filter? Well, I think one of the things about the internet is the way that it's structured is, in a way, it's not about the quality of the content, it's about the frequency of the content. If you want to have visibility online, what's important is not what you say, it's how often you say it and where you say it. So people are focused on promoting things as often as they can, putting the name of something out there as much as possible. You know, liking, for example, uh, on Facebook is a is one way of of doing all of this. That that has a the the least kind of significant possible interaction with something, and um, I think that the way that the internet is structured in terms of who ends up being seen and listened to is less of a function of what they're saying as to how sort of loud they're saying it, if you like. So that means that the power structure, which is intrinsic in the structure of the internet, is perhaps the most important and perhaps also the most alarming thing. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I also think that this is a, a very new phenomenon as well. So I think, um, you know, I think Facebook, I was looking at the numbers of, of, of um, I mean, 140 billion photographs on Facebook, but. I think even six years ago, Facebook had less than 100 million users. It was basically, you know, not really used by people. So I think that, I think there also will be a reaction in terms of just people being overwhelmed by the sheer amount of information that they're getting, the sheer amount of not only images, but all different kinds of information on the internet. And I think it's also not just a question of the power structure, but a question of people wanting to find those filters, those online filters, the way um, you know a museum or a gallery or a publication might act in the real world, uh, 
that that can you know enable them to to find things that they're they're more interested in or that they're able to dig deeper into but, but conversely i think also that pictures are supplanting words in some instances instagram is an, is a way of communicating within itself it negates the need for for words you know your picture tells your story it's like hieroglyphics used to be so in a way i don't know if people want that filter on 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 things like that for some people that's how they now mm -hmm. communicate you mm -hmm. don't need to write i like this you don't have to put the smiley face the, the instagram image is the mode mm -hmm. of communication so you're not as afraid as i feel mark is that either there are filters or people just turn away it's not fear i think there's that we're, you know if you're looking for something specific searching for something a filter is important because you need to find a way through the sea of images mm -hmm. but if you just want to communicate in a new way or, or in a way that perhaps the gener a younger generation than us find easier to communicate then no I think it's going to be it's on the rise there's, there's no there's no stopping it mm. I have to that does make me think of one thing though I mean Instagram there was recently a shooting at the bottom of the Empire State Building and um, somebody took a photo on their iPhone of <coughs> the guy that had been killed um, you know, a very close-up image that was posted on Instagram, Instagram with, you know, some vintage filter put over the top of it. And immediately what happened was he put a, a quote in comments. Um, he, he quoted a rap song, basically turning this into a kind of... Um, I mean, it just made it look like something that would be on the cover of a rap album. And this conversation started with people quoting rap lyrics back and forth with a picture that, you know, of a body that, I mean, of a, of a person that had died with a few minutes beforehand. So there is this other layer. I mean, I agree with you. I think that images are actually becoming a kind of language of their own that doesn't need to be, you know, um, textualized or, 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 you know, that it expressed in words. But there is this other layer that still remains where, um, I mean, I found that totally mind-blowing, mm -hmm. that, that you would suddenly, you know, I suppose that a picture that would have ended up on the cover of the New York Times was now in this context. Mm -hmm. It's being traded yeah. almost like a, mm -hmm. a commodity. Yeah, but if images are becoming a language on its own, um, you need to know which language are we speaking. I mean in order to, sp to communicate with words, there needs to be some sort of agreement about the, the meaning of the words. And in this case, when people can talk with images, but perhaps it's going to be a Babylonic thing where nobody understands the other part or perhaps understands the other part as in a completely different manner. I mean, how do we preserve meaning? And Simon, uh, a museum traditionally was also a center of meaning of education, of knowledge, uh, uh, an authority in a way. How does the Tate Modern, or how does you as uh, a photography curator at the Tate uh, respond to this function as a filter and somebody, uh, 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 an institution that uh, preserves meaning in a way? Well, probably I'll prove that we're not a very intelligent filter. I would imagine I've never even heard of um, Instagram, which is one of the th one embarrassment which I'm. I was just thinking, <laughs> what on earth is this thing, and should we have some at the Tate? And maybe not. <laughs> um, it's free. It's free. No, we probably we probably wouldn't want it. <laughs> um, I, I mean, one of the things that that's being suggested here, and one of the things that comes up very strongly, is that. Um, whether we use artists or photographers, I'm not sure it's important, but mm -hmm. whatever... Okay, sorry. Um, whether, whether we use the word artist or photographer, what's... Um, is it near, even nearer? Is that all right? Is it all right? Or just take it off. A little better. Yeah. Okay, like that. Is that better? It is. Okay. I said some really stupid stuff before, really quietly before. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, so whether we, whether we say like an artist or a photographer, what's important is that there's a, a kind of discourse or an intelligence, something, mm -hmm. um, something that uh, is purposeful and something that has a kind of um, uh, a, some kind of value behind it that I think is an interesting. And I think like the, the, the history of photography 
the history of photography, specifically outside the museum, but also within the museum, is a history of something which often looks as if it's not purposeful and, and kind of uh, arbitrary or objective or whichever term we might use, but actually does have a language and a history and a, and a, a set of kind of credible um, concerns. And so the, the sense of uh, filtering um, really depends on, on what those concerns are. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what's, very what's very interesting now is that there's a um, kinds of artistic practice which are, if you like, um, crossing over into, into those more um, arbitrary sets of um, processes and practices. So that you were mentioning Doug Rickart or whatever, you know, that the idea of artists actually using kind of found, which it found uh, objects, which is not in any way new, mm -hmm. but they are actually adding some kind of intelligence or some, well, intelligence is a stupid word, but they're adding some kind of organizing principle around that found material. So there's a massive difference for me between whatever the thing was that I haven't ever heard of mm -hmm. um, and Doug Rickard making a body of work about images that are found. And I think Trying to make that division between artists and, and photographers. Well, we, we, have to, photographers well, we have to make a, a division between yes. things that should be regarded by a museum and things that should be regarded as, vernac as kind of vernacular. And those things change over time. So mm. some of the things that people previously thought of as being vernacular are now often, show, particularly in America, often shown in museums. Yeah. So that these things are, are porous and fluid. So a, a photographer might be someone who just makes use of the science. Say you mentioned uh, photography as a science, just by pressing a button, button and create a photographical image. While an artist perhaps adds meaning to the image. Um, I think we're talking about two things. You have visual communication through internet, and then you get okay, that's a new way of communicate between people, Facebook, and so on. But I think a l photography is a language, and it's a building language, meaning a sense to inside in self the technique, of course, but also what the artist would like to show and present and build up and create. So I think we're talking about two different things. That's it. I think it does. But I think it's important to talk at length a little bit about that language, because mentioned a few times, you mentioned also the importance of education in, as an as a important tool to at least use this language in a sensible, meaningful manner. And again, Simon, I go back to you. Um, what's the function of, of a museum? Does a museum has a fun have a function in um, educating and training people in this say, visual literacy and to understand and read images in a sensible way? Well, I mean, yeah. Okay, so we were with. Uh, <laughs> go on then, once again. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, repeat the, the question. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Okay. Um, I was asking a question about the importance of education, and at school we learn how to write, how to read so we can understand each other. We, we are sure that we use the same common language. We already mentioned that it's quite hard to find a common language in the visual infinity. Um, does a museum has a function in educating people, in training them and creating some sort of visual literacy so people are aware of the language that is used? Uh, well, I get, I mean, in essence, yes, but then, on the other hand, uh, it depends what kind of museum you're talking about. For, for Tate, Tate is a, a fine art museum, mm -hmm. and um, we have, we, our, our strategy, our way of showing photography is that it should be within the history of art. Like, you understand mm -hmm. photography is an, an equivalent, equal form of um, production alongside sculpture, painting, installation, video. Um, but it, ha but as you say, it has its own history and it has its own language and its own kind of. Um, what, what's more problematic, and I guess more uh, leads towards the topic of th this discussion, is mm -hmm. whether it has a teleological progress. And yes. does photography actually go forward, or does it just go round and round and round in different and interesting ways? Can and you try to answer your own question? No, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> not not at all. But I think the 
that's you know that's something that you know, it's probably not the right context for it in this discussion, but the sense of like a history of modernist art, for example, that gets more abstract or more conceptual or more minimal leads in a particular direction. I don't think that's the case with photography. I don't think that there ever has been a sense of a kind of um, tendency go moving in one direction. I think photography's had a complex, rich, difficult history, and you could find, you know, you could find uh, progress in certain technical areas, but I'm not sure that it has that kind of, I'm not sure what we could identify a, a point that it's moving towards at which, unless we just said it just got bigger. Um, which obviously it did, and it would be really nice if it got smaller again. You know. how, how do you react upon that it's getting bigger? Asking for bigger budgets? No, I just meant all the prints got really big. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but more expensive as well. No, not the prints getting bigger. I think, I think if everybody is taking pictures, as everybody now is, it forces those who want to set themselves apart from the mass and don't want to use it as a communication tool but want to create something meaningful mm -hmm. uh, in a more artistic fray, it con um, context or editorial advertising, it forces them to do something more out of the ordinary. It forces people to push their work mm -hmm. in any number of ways. So whether that's making prints that are mind-blowing in quality, whether it's making prints that are more like sculpture, whether it's using complicated setups within a picture, mm -hmm. I think that there's still a long way for photography to go and for these avenues to be explored and that perhaps the, the mass communication of Instagram will make that change happen faster or will make people try harder to create something that sets them apart. Mm -hmm. I think that you're, as a picture editor with Wallpaper Magazine, uh, is it, uh, that you're looking at things that is, makes a difference, is different all the time. Yeah, I mean, not all the time, but it's very important that we use new talent and that we don't become static or rooted in the past. So I'm always looking at, at new photographers' work or photographers who are doing new projects which are unexpected and I see a lot of work and a lot of it can look very very similar but then there are things which really really shine through and it isn't always things that have an obvious application to an editorial or advertising context which is where I'm coming from but I can still recognize that it's something mm -hmm. something very very different I mean when we talked before this lecture we thought it would be interesting for the viewers to see some work of photographers who we think are, are interesting, some young photographers. So um, there's a few examples of, of people that I pulled out. There's a, an American photographer called Drew Donovan. Um, so perhaps, I, I yes. We have some slides of her work here. Uh, Drew used to assist Larry Sultan, who I'm sure most of you have heard of, and she's got a very beautiful sensibility. And her work explores the human body and how we use it to um, show and express affection, <coughs> excuse me, how we care for ourselves and one another and uh, ways in which we use the body as self-representation. So she looks at adolescents, at dancers, at bodybuilders, at people transforming themselves through surgery. But her work isn't strictly documentary. What she does is she often observes people doing these things for real, and then she goes and thinks about them, and then sets them up with models and sets and props, um, which results in, in quite an odd uh, feeling in the viewer because you know you're looking at something which is quite intimate and heartfelt mm -hmm. but it's also unreal to quite a degree um, this is some of the early work of hers this is adolescents losing control of their bodies um, in quite sort of staggering dramatic um, examples and then the second series which we'll come on to is where um, Drew witnessed the death of a close friend who she'd been caring for and her way of, of dealing with this was to reenact it all with, with models uh, renting a room and over the course of a month restaging the process of caring for and seeing ultimately uh, her friend pass away. It's a black and white series called, called Lifting Water. This is the first, the first image from that series. So I think her work is very interesting because it really does blur the boundaries. Um, but in a very, very subtle, nuanced way. Um, in, I think it would be uh, 
There's a photographer that I have, that I've identified that I think is the exact opposite of um, Drew Donovan in the sense that he's doing something that's also about blurring the boundaries, but in the least possible subtle and nuanced way. Um, so maybe after this, if we could look at Asker Carlson. So, um, Asker Carlson is a Danish photographer and um, he did a book uh, called Wrong. Um, I think it was in 2010 and he, um, he uses, uh, I mean he kind of, he, he doesn't want to call himself a photographer. He basically, I think he even at one point said that his, the pixels are his raw material. So he, um, he makes these images which are clearly um, heavily photoshopped. They, you know, they couldn't possibly be real. Um, but what he's doing, I think, is engaging with this idea of, you know, photography being somehow a truth, um, somehow an objective document of reality, and and saying, look, all of this is actually real. You know, you have to accept this this impossible reality. And um, he's really trying to to just show. I mean, I think in a way this work really shows that, that total illusion. Um, and yeah, there's, this is, a new, this is another series called Hester, which is um, focusing on the female nude. Um, but I think it, in a way that, that that's coming from a similar place, but you know, it's, it's obviously a lot less, a lot less subtle and but it's also, it still has emotional impact, and yeah, it's sort of pushing pushing photography in a very different different direction, uh, which I think can only be applauded. I mean, there are there are other people who are doing things, taking it in a, in a completely different way. If I if I talk about another person, um, a photographer called Lather Wilson, who who uh, I think we have some slides of as well. I mean, she starts with photographs of fairly idealized American landscapes, but then physically transforms and alters the images you know by distorting cutting folding curling the prints uh in some work and then in more extreme cases by crumpling them up and pouring concrete all over them which means that the prints take on a sort of physical aspect all of their own they become almost sculptural uh whether that's classical photography that someone like Ansel Adams or Colton Watkins would be happy with in the landscape context, I don't know, but it has a real, a real power to it. Uh, and it's, again, it's sort of pushing a fairly conventional form of photography in a very unexpected physical direction. I want to, to stop here for a moment. You, you can show the work, but there are two things that I I uh, want to ask a question about because the first series more or less also questions the the truthfulness of, of photography. The first is that reenactment of something and it blurs the boundaries between staged or documentary photography by making use of different languages and well you're not sure what language uh, is talking to you yeah. uh, in the loudest way and of course your first example quite obviously uh, battles reality and truthfulness, uh, but then again, it immediately um, um, confronts you with the question of how truthful and which quite complex relationship does photography have with has with with photography uh, with reality. And um, François uh, Hebel, those two things, uh, uh, and the other thing, sorry, it was the the tactility of the print and go back to the physical thing, and you tear it apart, you add concrete and you paint on it. Those two things, the emphasis on the physical print and the question of reality and photography, are those things, because you, you see a lot of photography for the festival, are those two things that are really uh, uh, central points in, in photography at this uh, moment? Um, I'm not sure it's central point. I, th I think it's a new, it's part of the many new directions which are very exciting in photography. I think photography has ne never been so opened. I mean, uh, when I started working in photography 30 years ago, photography was black and white, it was 11 by 14 inches, and that was the end of the story. Otherwise, it was kind of a, a crime, you know? And, uh, 
so I, I, I think photography is gaining freedom. Um, and I would not oppose, like my dear Christine just did, um, the one genre of photography to the other. I think it's, 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 a, it's a huge territory. And um, the, the only questions are, the, and I think it's been pointed extensively, but very wisely in your presentation, it's a, the, the question of editing. Um, who edits, who helps editing, how do you learn editing? Um, and the word editing that came from the editorial market is, is, is a word that should be applied to all of photography nowadays. Um, and the other thing is how do you um, talk the language of photography? Um, and I think that's the two issues because I mean it's becoming wider and wider. So whether it's done with concrete or it's done you know, in, in the regular way, whether it's glued on the wall like JR or whatever, is, you know, it, the, the ability to make your taste, to build your taste, to make up your choice, to become a collector eventually, which is one of the purposes of being here, um, is the interesting issue. Um, and I just want to add something about, about one of our experiences that actually started at the Foam uh, Museum years ago, and you don't even know about it, I'm going to tell you, um, is, is, is we just um, published a game uh, in France, which origin originally was for kids from 10 to 20, about reading photography. And it's a game which is going to be in all French schools and high schools and whatever. Um, and it's like a box like this, full of pictures, which are all pictures that one day have been exhibited at the festival. And what does the game consist in? It consists in having a group of people, like a class form, divided in four teams. They fight against one another. What do they fight with? With words. And I think this is the, the, the interesting things, is you, you come from photography. Photography is, as you said, the language of the generations now, sometimes prior to words. Um, and it's how do you come back to words? How do you put words? How do you put thinking? How do you put sensitivity um, on phot photographs? And, and, and this is the important in the future uh, issue. Is how, and that, that goes back to, that will help the editing, that will help the choice that will help the creativity. And um, let's not forget that in the middle there are the artists. But we have to find words for giving meaning to the pictures, you mean? We, we have to find words and to we create have- create a new vocabulary. And, and, and we have also to train. I mean, the reason why we created that game in France about for the schools, which actually we was asked last week for an old people home as well, you know, because they, they thought it was going to be helpful as well, um, is because I was totally fed up with the, um, we had all these kids coming when they go back to school. We have 10,000 kids that were here this past three weeks coming to see the exhibitions in Arles. Um, and, and in the very first years, 10 years ago, we were using the pinhole camera, you know, these things that you do with kids all over the world. Let's do the pinhole camera. It's, very, it's, gonna, it's fun. You're going to see it's magic. What do you learn with pinhole camera? You learn the techniques of optics. You learn how to be an optical engineer. You don't learn how to be a photographer. You don't read the picture. Mm -hmm. So I said, this is, this is te terminé. This is, this is over. We're not going to use the pinhole camera anymore. Let's invent something else. And I gave the example of the thing we did years ago um, after the, um, the master class. Uh, we had a master class exhibition at the Foam. And we, uh, I, at the time, there was all these projects by future editorial photographers. Um, and I, I sort of we put it together as this system on the wall that you could only put five pictures on the wall, but you had a box with 20. And the public had to, f to decide which five pictures were going to tell the story, like in a magazine, double spreads. Um, and, and so the, the public had to, to, make, to leave 15 photographs out. And that was kind of education of how to choose the pictures to tell something. And this is from there, we've built something, given, putting away the pinhole, and we now have this, this game. And I think it's very important we find these kind of uh, possibilities to, learn, to, to go back to words, to go back to sensitivity, go back to exchange. To, the photography becomes a social place as well. You think that a festival as the Rencontre has a function within this need to go back to the words? I think so. Yeah. And um, Christine, to go back to you, um, how do you see the, 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 the function of a gallery uh, within the, the near future? Because a gallery always, of course, is just a trading place, to be bluntly. Yeah? You select 
you edit perhaps, and you present something that you think is meaningful, but also uh, commercially uh, uh, of value. Um, how do you respond to this changing environment and also the need to add perhaps a different kind of meaning to, uh, to photography? Well, uh, I would say that the first role of the gallery is not to sell or to communicate or to be a filter. It's to be um, a production house. It's somebody who feeds the other artists, who help them to produce, uh, to follow their project. So the main role of a gallery is to be a house for artists. Then from that, of course, you have the public, you have the collector, you, you deal with museum, festival, and we're all collaborating to diffuse works, artists, and stuff like that. But for me, it's really the main role of a gallery is that. Otherwise, if we'll be there only for selling, I think we can disappear. The selling is a necessary evil to it's fulfill not a your necessary primary task. Evil. It's, uh, I think that uh, if uh, there is a filter, has a gallery, we have, we obviously we are an expert. We we do a job like any other ones, and we are among the people who can promote artists and make discovery like any other creator. I do that. I do it. I think. But the thing is, the main filter is a market at the end of it, because obviously we have 45 billion of image every day. But at the end of it, what a collector, what a museum, what would be a show, what would be a book, is linked to the market today. So that could be the ultimate filter, I mean, towards waiting for a story, of course. Uh, you, prom yes, you, you want to promote? the artists and the artworks that you think is worth promoting. Yeah, of course. Um, Simon, I think it's a bit different, but perhaps a bit the same with you. To what extent can you actually promote as uh, a curator with the Tate? Or are you more following uh, developments instead of pushing them? Um, well, the, the collection for photography at Tate is, is a new uh, venture. So we're starting very late and we're still looking backwards a lot. So really what, um, what the pr most of my time is spent thinking about how we're going to acquire works from the 1930s and the 1960s and the 1970s. But of course... Does it still make sense to do so? I mean, all the other museums already did it, so why restore... A yeah, well, we're the only one in London, so it makes a lot of sense if you're British. It's like really important, uh, really important for, the, for, our, uh, for our visitors. Um, but having said that, there's no... Um, there's no, uh, there's no way of looking back. There's no way of understanding history without looking at what's going on now. And the, the, the way that Tate um, operates, and the, the reason that indeed that Tate has a photography curator is, um, r finally, is recognizing that you, you can't, um, you, looking at contemporary practice, you can no longer disentangle these, these different kinds of practice. And you can no longer say, oh yeah, photography was this other history that had its own museums and its own institutions, and it, we should never have, we, don't, we didn't need to worry about it. That's just no longer possible. And therefore, it, it doesn't make any sense to try and keep a separate photography as a separate thing. Um, but one of the things I wanted to mention as well, as well as thinking about uh, photography and language and how we talk about it, is also, from the museum's point of view, is to think about it as, as a practice, the physical sense of, of, of printing, of um, not only of editing, but of, of making objects and making work, which I think is really important. Um, so of course, I, I because you can only collect physical objects. Or mm -hmm. are you going to collect hard drives as well? Yeah, you know, like there's always somebody... Which is physical in the end as well. As usually somebody at this point says, um, I'll give you my zip drive and see where you can plug, in, plug it in. Exactly. You know, that, that kind of um, um, the ob obsolescence of technology that's kind of problematic. But right now we're collecting objects, obviously, in the future, if there are interesting projects which are presented in a different way. I mean, Tate, for example, I mean, this is not relevant to a photography discussion, but Tate now has a really strong program of performance art. That's something that people in the past found, that, found it very, very difficult to, to um, imagine collecting. You know, how do you collect performance? Collect the the registration, the right yeah. to stage it or whatever. Yeah. But you know, there are ways to to um, to collect things that are different. But I, I think what it, it, it's important to think about to think about prints as objects, and that's something that you can learn in a museum. You can go and see 
Um, I got some examples that I put up. Um, yeah. Shall I show them? Or, mm -hmm. I don't know. Now, I'm, not, I'm, actually, <laughs> I'm actually not showing anything that's to do with the museum because, as I said, we're really looking very uh, historically and we're not looking uh, at contemporary work uh, quite so often. Um, but I've, I just show the first two. Um, for, uh, you'll notice from my selection that the, the future of photography is just women and Japanese women, and, uh, <laughs> but as think, we all are very uh, yeah, aware and, of, and probably <laughs> 11 by 14 inch prints as well. But no, anyway, so I, I've got two examples. So um, Akiko Takazawa, who makes the most incredible prints, which are then um, these first examples are then um, screen varnished, so that the prints themselves, the paper picks up the the, the varnish from the screen and makes these really sensational objects. And when when they're when they're in an exhibition. Um, it's a great kind of pleasure in actually being in front of the object. And I think that's really very, very important. The second series, which you're seeing, is uh, a color types, and this is an, an ancient process. Something that she's working with um, Benrido in Kyoto, which is one of the last places to make color types um, in the world. And I think that um, that's very, very important. This in engagement with old processes, the engagement with of keeping these things going, but also taking the the visual language in new and interesting um, directions. The second example I mentioned very quickly, uh, Sakiko Nomura. Um, some of her work you might know, this is from a series um, called uh, Kuriyami, or Black Darkness. It's all about the, the use of black and the dark kind of pigment. I put two slides up, selections from Kuriyami. That very, very black one is, a, is the eye of a, a tiger. In, you, you can really see it. No, nothing to do with the song. Um, but uh, you can see it in the actual print. Um, the next ones that are coming up, a really amazing, I mean, you might not see very much there, but it's a reversed solarization, so you're seeing a totally black, these are all unique objects, uh, a totally black, <laughs> this one you're probably not seeing very much at all, but when you're in front of it, um, this is my reason for bringing them, when you're in front of it, you're seeing all of the outlines of all, these, of, of all the objects in perfect silver. Absolutely um, stunning. I think that's probably the last one we can probably finish. But, but um, Simon, you, you make perfectly clear that there is a huge difference between a screen yeah. and the actual object. Well, this is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, for a museum, of course, we, of course, we want people to come to the museum, and, and I think photographers, <laughs> and we have a gift shop. Uh, um, <laughs> but photographers who are making work that absolutely has to be seen, it physically you have to stand up. You know, to see Sikiko's. Uh, Kind of reverse polarization, uh, solarizations. You have to be there. You have to, you know, you, you know, you have to be close. You have to be physically in proximity to the to the object, and that's something for a museum, which is really important. And I think because that's the only raison d'être. It's not for the a only. Museum, it's because not the only you have to be in front of the object yeah. to have this meeting, a unique meeting with the object. Is this Mark? Is this a reaction uh, upon all these images that are? on the same screen without any the added emotional value that is so intrinsic to the physical print. Is there a longing to go back to the old photochemical, photochemical process and the actual object? Um, well, as, a, as an answer, um, and so that the Japanese guys don't feel left out, I want to show a Japanese male photographer. Um, uh, his name's uh, Daisuke Yokota. And, um, I think he's actually on show at, um, at Unseen, um, but his, these images are, um, I guess what you could call it is re-photography. So he starts by taking them with a compact digital camera, and then he photographs the print that he makes from this with a 6x7 camera. And then he photographs it in color with uh, another camera, and each image is photographed 10 times to get to the result. Um, I mean, this is a guy who's maybe, you know, 20, I think 27, 28 years old. Um, I mean, what I think is interesting about this is something I, I, I kind of mentioned in my introduction is that, yes, there is that, what you're mentioning of maybe going back to, I mean, he's got a dark room set up in his bathroom in his little apartment in Tokyo, but also, He's not saying, oh, digital, I don't want to deal with that. Um, I will only go analog. This starts from a digital image. He's done another series called, um, uh, I, I always get mixed up, one of them's Backyard, one of them's Sight. And he's done something very similar, but with Photoshop, um, where instead of adding noise, he's photographed the same object multiple times and layered that in, in Photoshop. 
And what he's trying to do with his work, he, he says that what inspires him basically is music and film. And what he wants to do is find the photographic equivalent of, particularly in electronic music, of, of delay, of reverb, of echo. So to try and find a visual way of using those kinds of concepts. Um, and I mean, actually, you, mean you, can, you can see them slightly better than, than Simon's. Um, but but I, I would say, though, that, that it, it's the kind of thing that you actually just have to see as a print um, for it really to, to function. There's something else really interesting in what you're saying as well that I think is self-evident, probably everybody in this room, but the, the boundaries between digital and analog are completely porous. There's hardly anybody who's only... Well, there, there are people, but most people are making analog, either making analog film and then scanning them or making digital prints, or they're making digital prints and then having some kind of um, analog print made from it. So there's this, the porosity between the two is really interesting. And I think it, in that example, you can see the extension of the, I mean, what's I think really important for photography is that we understand the entire of the medium. So the camera, the darkroom, the print, Photoshop, if that's part of it, the book, the book is part of it as well. So, the medium of photography is not um, is not a camera, as, as you were saying. It's not a pinhole camera or optics. It's everything, darkroom, computer, book, f from the beginning to end. I think that's that's really important. Is it something, James, uh, as a picture editor, that you can? Uh, use as well uh, because of course the magazine is printed matter it's a more or less fixed medium and how can you do justice to that whole range of, of uh, photography as just explained by Simon or is this for you just an uh, an impossibility um, some of the examples would be an, impos an impossibility I mean we could lavish expensive varnish treatments on pages or try and get the best paper stock but you would never be able to show the solarized work mm -hmm. in the same context. Um, for me, I think what's interesting in an editorial environment is using the photographers who are pushing that, their work in that way, but then reining them in and teaming them up with a stylist or with an interior stylist or finding a way that their work can translate in a very unexpected fashion mm -hmm into an editorial or advertising context. So the pictures would still have the identity of the photographer and still be something very odd and, and unique, but they, no, they could never fully, fully approximate what you would see if you went to Simon's museum. Uh, luckily not for Simon. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. But well, I, well, I can say, I mean, it's funny that we show this Japanese in the next uh, month for Photo Months in Paris, I will show the work of Corinne Mercadier. And she was one of shooting and the reshooting and reshooting. The, and she will end up with a negative will be a Polaroid. And then now the Polaroid doesn't exist anymore. So she spent the last seven years to change her language, keeping, trying to keep the poetic of it. And right now, she's one of the best Photoshop maker you can dream. And uh, you will, I mean, I wish people can come to see the show because you, can, you cannot see Photoshop at all. But so, I mean, you can also progress and change languages, go back to dark room. I mean, uh, we're working right now, I don't know, 18 photographers, not one of them has the same camera, the same printing, the same matter, the same paper, the same computer, even if. So I think uh, right now, it's, I like the term that uh, Francois used, it's freedom. And uh, we have the freedom of the nostalgia still, and because of course analog techniques are disappearing, the paper is disappearing. And we have also all the future, which is an interesting moment for photography languages, I guess. If, if we were just talking about photography in terms of your clients and collectors. No, do I'm you, talking no, no, about no. artists. No, I know, but if we were talking about it like that, do you see uh, trends in what people are interested in collecting? Are people still very much interested in owning prints which are black and white and hand printed? Or are they as happy to invest in really experimental light boxes or? Well, you know, uh, we, we are a Caterpillar Art Gallery, so we're also selling videos, which is quite tough to sell. But then you have collector for everything. So I guess now, 
if I will, you know, sell posters, maybe it could be a problem. We we hang sometimes. I have an artist sometimes like to make posters. So and then we say, okay, you can buy the poster if you like. Of course, it's not the same price and the specific one. But no, yes, it's still photography is still an object, and I hope it will still be an object because uh, photography is also linked to what we call a painting in terms of le tableau, not pictural object, but it's the same idea. I mean, I don't want to go back to Jeff Wall's uh, speak, but we talk about image which is a, a masterpiece and it's a built image most of the time. It can be, the thing which is interesting right now is more the, the skip between a reportage, documentary, based artist, photograph, author, I mean, all the boundaries have been blurred by the artists themselves. Mm. I remember um, seven years ago, I was with Guy Tillim in Madrid, and he asked me for it to be in a gallery. I said, well, you know, you have to go to a specific uh, gallery who do reportage like Vu or whatever, Magnum. And I was mistaken. Now he's selling 20,000 each picture. He's in a contemporary art gallery in New York. And wherever his work is reportage based, we could say that, it's also not considered as an artist now. So I like this idea that, uh, like Luc Delay, who moved from war reporter to being an artist. And I went to talk with a friend of, of him who are who still in a war reportage. And they say, well, you know, we don't mind that Luke is a good artist now. We're just missing the war artist. Mm -hmm. Christine, you mentioned the relationship between photography and, and painting, and you used the word tableau even. Yeah. Francois, your freedom, eh? finally there's freedom for photography. Isn't it the freedom of being finally liberated from those change of being compared with painting or using the visual aesthetic language of painting, are we now not witnessing finally the emancipation of photography and now it's grown up and an adult? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> No, for sure. It's, it's really the time. I mean, it's, uh, it's also a very confusing time. I mean, I, I understand for the public, I mean, public have never been so, coming so massively in the, in the lectures, in all the, 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 the places where we can sort of address what we're addressing here today in other, in other places. So it, it shows some confusion. It should, I mean, and we also see a lot of terrible things happening. I mean, in Paris, let's not talk about you know, foreign things, but I mean, in Paris, if any of you have ever been to the Luxembourg parks in the past 15 years, we have to bear terrible reportage pictures on the grill of the Luxembourg Park when you do your jogging. I mean, it's absolutely terrible. Um, you know, so, but I mean, how are you going to tell 500,000 people that go next to that every day that it's terrible? I mean, this is, you, you know, you're not lecturing everyone. I mean, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's so... Uh, and maybe it's terrible for me, it's not terrible for somebody else, and that's all, I mean, that's about talking about art. Um, we actually can show... Yes, of course I was... Yeah, they, they, did, they, they told us to do some homework and bring some pictures, yeah. so... Just to avoid um, that you would only watch them. I have no Japanese, sorry. If we can go just one by one, and I'd like to say words before, it's, it's always... Um, uh, very uh, intimidating to say that you, you, you do the job we, we do around this table. It's uh, because we, we, I don't trust we discover photographers. I, I, I trust we have the chance to do the job we're doing and to, to sometimes come across a photographer that suddenly is different. Um, but the photographer discovers himself one day and is courageous enough to embrace a work, a life uh, as an artist. And I, I think this should always, always be remembered. Um, it's not that it's one more product. Uh, it's, it's a life of somebody, and it it's really translates. Uh, the first photographer um, I would like to uh, bring here, and it was, it's, um, I hope for you, unseen photographer. Have you ever heard about Thomas DeVoe? Yeah. Yes, one. How many? Two. Okay, good. So he's quite unseen photographer. So if we could, this is um, a very provocative picture, as you can see, um, not because of the picture, because it's taken in Paris photo, and we show it in unseen. So if we can go to the next, which is also taken in Paris photo, like the next as well. Um, and you already start to wonder why the hell do I show you these pictures and the next as well. So start to look at the hair, for instance, of this picture. And the next one, look at the, the kid, the hands, uh, the hair again. 
And, and then you, um, you carefully look at this one to the textile, okay? I mean, you have in mind this very beautiful textile, this hand as well. Um, and then you, you, this man is doing something very curious. Um, and, and then you get to this very beautiful flower arrangement. Um, and and uh, it's becoming, uh, so look at, look at the arm here and the, the hair, and you'll start to understand something, don't you? Um, okay, this is, this is not the unseen photographer. This is William Egglestone signing a book um, at Paris Photo. Um, and now comes the picture, finally. Sorry, so this picture is made out of all the pictures you've seen before. Uh, you recognize the hair, the arms, and on, on the top end there, the hands of Egglestone signing. Um, so this one picture is one of very many that, uh, as uh, Simon um, said before, you will have to come to Arles to see them next year. But I mean, it's, it's, um, it's it very, it, it needs to be printed very large. It, it's a physical experience. Um, and it's made uh, of all this crap picture you saw just before. Um, so his name um, should come back again if you want to write to him before, but he, he will refuse anything before, obviously. Um, so it was done for a project for photography.com that asked him 24 hours at Paris Photo last year. Um, the next photographer is Maurice Uday. Have you heard about Maurice Uday? No. <laughs> okay, so Maurice Houdai um, does these uh, very strange things with photography. It's nearly black and nothing on it, but I mean, it's not quite Japanese. Um, and it's, um, I don't think you ever saw this. Um, but it's becoming absolutely abstract and beautiful at the same time. Um, you, you actually, when it goes on the wall, it's becoming something different again. Um, so, it, actually, if we stop on this picture, all what you saw before is um, actually uh, tools for, um, at the 19th century, this guy uh, made the first zooming lens that um, existed. And this is where all the tools he was using to do the zoom that you now see on this picture. So. It's actually all technical stuff that becomes on the wall a sort of very poetic uh, proposal. Um, so if you go to the next, um, this was in our last year. Unfortunately, none of you has seen it, so it's unseen pictures. Um, this is to say that there's a lot of pictures also in the archives that are waiting to be seen. It's not necessarily in the future, but it's also pictures that need to be to get a new reading. And I, and I think this is something that we haven't addressed here, but it's a reading of the archive, which was gonna be, I mean, you addressed it in, at the end of your lecture slightly, saying, you know, what are we gonna do with the archives? But this is a typical example. This, is, this was a sleep in the Société Française de Photographie in Paris. And this brilliant young curator, Luce Le Bart, suddenly picked it up and made something different out of it. And uh, there was a whole collection of them. So if we go to the next, this was, a, remember his name, Maurice Uday, is a real photographer of the future from the past. Um, this is a totally unseen photographer. Um, actually, if we go to the next picture, um, it's an unseen photographer, but I thought you would need some of that at the end of a projection. <laughs> and, um, it's unseen um, because it's actually pictures from the 40, from a Japanese, actually, a magazine um, of nude um, women. And, but the, the name of the photographer has been totally forgotten. I mean, so it's, it's like lost uh, everywhere. But uh, it's there an artist that has decided to revive those pictures by doing uh, interventions on them. And suddenly it becomes something different with all these pins, this kind of a very aggressive violence of pins all over the women. And, and, and putting the, um, the faces away sometimes and doing sort of a totally different graphics, tearing the pictures off um, from the book, tearing the pictures itself, and very provocatively calling it quoi de plus douce, what can be more soft. Um, so it's, it's another way of approaching photography, which is reappropriation, as was said before. Is this, is this, sorry to interrupt, Francois, is this also important because we mentioned the, the, the new importance of being an editor. Of course, editing art is a very uh, uh, old tradition, but is it for you, besides the immediate visual quality, also important because it is editing uh, editing the past towards a new future? I, I think it's part of the freedom, it's reappropriation, as we showed in this show last year from Iran. I mean, it's, it's the way you reappropriate photography, reading of photography, whether you're an artist or you're a curator. Um, there's many, many ways to approach photography today, and that's one of the many ways to do it. But I mean, this is another dimension again, because then uh, sort of a, an artist that does is sort of a 
uh, craft work um, is sensitivity on top of something which has been already done. I mean, it's as old as the history of art, but I mean, it's a... So anyway, this, as, this was an unseen photographer. I thought the um, finishing by the nobody uh, name was quite interesting, but the artist's name is Claudia Widobro, and uh, uh, one of the many reasons, bad reasons to uh, show it to you today is that it was uh, her birthday weekend and she's here, so I thought it was good as you saw uh, this work. That was a so, gift to do to, uh, to an artist to show the work. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>